Good evening, family. Happy Tuesday. We are in the building. A warning by Anonymous, Chapter 2, Part 2. Get your beverages. Let's go ahead and settle in. Hope everybody's doing well. We're going to get started on page 67. And today is an interesting day because the House just released the impeachment report. So that's on our page if you want to check that out. A good about 20 minute read. And so it's just the full report, not a news version of the report, but a full report from Congress. So check that out. But today we're reading a warning by Anonymous. And I'm your word warrior. Okay. So we're going to start with the president's sense of justice. When I refer to justice, it's not about law and order. Cicero defined the concept as a way of characterizing how an individual treats others. Does this person maintain good fellowship with other people? Does he or she give everyone what they deserve? Now, remember, we're talking about Cicero from part one of chapter two, where he laid out um, basically the elements of ethical leadership. And so that's what he's referring this to referring to. And does the individual keep faith in contracts and promises? These are the qualities of a just person. Cicero adds to the mix that this type of person also displays beneficence, beneficence and liberality, i.e. they are kind and generous. Donald Trump certainly thinks a lot about justice, so much so, in fact, that the president has tweeted about something being, quote unquote, fair or unfair nearly 200 times since taking office. His concern tends to be whether he is being treated fairly personally. Nothing, so quote, nothing funny about Tired Saturday Night Live on fake news NBC, unquote. He tweeted after the show mocked a White House press conference in February of 2019. Question is, quote, how do the networks get away with these total Republican hit jobs without retribution? Likewise, for many other shows, very unfair and should be looked into. This is the real collusion, unquote. The president was insinuating that television networks needed to be investigated and punished for poking fun at him. Thankfully, no one was dumb enough to follow up with the Federal Communications Commissions to put them on the case. He spends a lot of time talking to staff about perceived injustices. Trump will complain about his coverage, his critics, and anything else that he believes is unfair. Then he will send White House aides on an endless quest to quote unquote, fix it. The president might want an aide to get on the phone to scold a television commentator who's been disagreeing with him or tell a foreign leader that we're quote unquote done dealing with their country because Trump doesn't like what they've said about a White House policy. It's gotten so tiring that aides will acknowledge the gripe and pledge to remedy it while letting it drop to the very bottom or off their to-do list because the problem is impossible to fix, pointless to address, or requires a counterproductive solution. No venue is off limits from his complaints of injustice. Shortly after assuming the duties of commander in chief, Trump traveled to Central Intelligence Agency headquarters to speak to America's covert workforce Journey Grace. Co workforce. His remarks were book ended with complaints about unfair news coverage. Quote, as you know, I have a running war with the media, he told the audience. They are the most dishonest human beings on earth. All of us watching watching it wince. The president was making his comments in the most inappropriate setting, not just because he was at the CIA, but because he was standing in front of the agency's memorial wall for fallen officers. President Trump did the same four months later in front of hundreds of U.S. Coast Guard Academy cadets, turning part of their commencement ceremony into a rant about the press. Quote, look at the way I've been treated lately, he remarked, going off script and shaking his head. Quote, no politician in history, and I say this with great surety, has been treated worse or more unfairly, unquote. When it comes to his treatment of others, it's difficult to say the president meets Cicero's criteria. In fact, Trump is better described as quote unquote ruthless than just. He is not solely, this is not solely my assessment. It's his own self-perception. Quote, when someone attacks me, I always attack back except 100% more he tweeted in 2012, describing his attitude of unequal retribution as a quote unquote way of life. Trump echoed the sentiment in his book, The Art of the Deal, writing that when he believes he's been being treated unfairly, my general attitude all my life has been to fight back very hard. 
Trump's hit hard philosophy is not reserved for those who have legitimately wronged him. The president picks fights indiscriminately. The volume of examples is breathtaking. Look no further than his Twitter account on any given week or, sh or short digest of the news. One moment he may be attacking soccer star Megan Rapinoe, and the next he's mocking the Prime Minister of Denmark, Med Fredrickson. Other times he's assailing his own top officials. And we all know this, right? Because <laughs> any one of his people at any moment cannot all of a sudden become not his people, right? So you could be in the camp and then all of a sudden you are out for the squad. So they're saying he doesn't he doesn't hold back, right? So if you are in the squad, you're cool. Once you're out of the squad, you're about to get it. And so I'm just curious, like every person at one point or another, Manafort, Cohen, Comey, Kelly, everybody that have been in are now out. And it's funny how no one listens. All of a sudden, they're not credible. But they were credible when they were in, but now they're not credible. Okay. The attacks on his hand-picked chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, are a recurring example. Trump regularly launches unpro unprovoked broadsides against Powell and his independent agency, which the president is frustrated that he doesn't control. In separate Twitter out outbursts, Trump suggests the Federal Reserve chairman cannot mentally keep up with central banks in other countries and asks followers which was, quote unquote, a bigger enemy of the United States, Powell or China's dictator. All of this because Powell's agency has been candid about economic indicators that show the president's policies have been risky. So again, if you speak against him, oh, he's going to let loose. And it's nothing that's credible of any substance, truth, or any, or even candor. It's really just to throw wrenches to confuse his followers because they'll jump on any train. Giving nicknames to his targets is a favorite tactic too, allowing the president to turn attacks into instant memes. He road tests the insulting monikers with friends and is elated he has a new one to give to Dan, the social media aide. There's the dang Dick, Senator Dick Blumenthal, Pocahontas, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Low Energy Jeb, former Governor Jeb Bush, Slimeball, Jim Comey, MS-13 lover, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Dumb as a Rock, Micah, MSNBC's or Micah uh, Brzezinski, the dumbest man on television, CNN's Don Lemon, and so on. Often Trump hones in on physical features using names like Fat Jerry, Representative Jerry Nadler, Little Marco, Senator Marco Rubio, and Dumbo for his former Secret Service director. Now stop for a second. How would you treat your child if they were coming home speaking in such a manner about their teachers, principals, administrators, the bus driver, the cafeteria worker, a janitor. If they came in speaking about them in such a manner, uh, Fat Jerry, Dumbo, Little Marco, we would have something to say for real and quickly, and we should. And what's funny is we accept this leadership because why? That, that, that shouldn't be a partisan issue, knowing how to treat people as a human and with respect. But it's interesting, that also is not something that will throw the flag, no one will throw the flag for that either. Other acid-tongued presidents have had words for people they didn't like, but I can't think of any who regularly went out of their way to humiliate people with childish nicknames. If there is any silver lining, it's that he typically keeps the R-rated ones within the West Wing, which means he doesn't release the R-rated ones, so I guess we should be grateful that we don't hear the cuss words or the vulgar ones, but his own people do. There are no two ways about it. Trump is a bully. By intimidating others, he believes he can get what he wants, not what is fair. It's a philosophy he brags about. He regles staff with stories about filing meritless claims in court against other companies in order to coerce them to back down or to get a better deal. That's how you get them to do what you want. During the 2016 campaign, journalist Bob Woodward asked Trump about President Obama's view that real power means you can get what you want without exerting violence. In his response, Trump made a revealing confession, quote, real power is through respect. Real power is, I don't even want to use the word, fear. President Trump shows no mercy. Political opponent, opponents are wartime opponents, and there should be no clemency. Trump remains fixated on his previous presidential rival years into his tenure, continuously disparaging and demeaning her. It may be a different situation if he expected to fall expected to face off again with Hillary Clinton, yet she appears to be finished with public office. Don't get me wrong, no one in the Trump White House is a fan of Hillary Clinton, but we started to find the president's chronic animosity toward her to be a little weird. Like what he's saying is like, look, get over it, bro. Like you're in the office. 
Um, somehow you figured out the electoral vote and got that, but you didn't win the popular vote, so he's hung up on that. And ultimately, they're saying, like, yeah, in politics, we don't like people, but we don't continue to um, focus in and hone in and, and focus all our attention on people that have already long since passed. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And, and when you do that, what do you have effort for? Nothing. So we started to find the president's chronic animosity toward her to be a little weird. He has tweeted about Clinton hundreds of times since taking office. And if I were her, I would be sitting back like, you're welcome, because clearly you seem to be um, fixated on me and you're welcome since you can't move on or do your job. He has even flirted with using <clears throat> the powers of his office to investigate and prosecute her, as we will discuss. Electoral defeat is not enough. Donald Trump wants total defeat of his opponents. Remember I said he can't handle that he did not win the popular vote. And so in his mind, he is like hung up on that instead of focused on actually doing the job. Cicero said justice is to be measured by whether someone keeps promises too. Sadly, Trump's past is rife with allegations of stifed contractors, unpaid employees, broken agreements, and more. An investigation by USA Today found he'd been involved in more than 3,500 hundred lawsuits over the span of three decades, many of which included claims by individuals who said he and his companies failed to pay them. 3,500 lawsuits. His businesses also received repeated citations from the government for violating the Fair Labor Standards Act and failing to pay overtime or minimum wage. His business, so not only did private citizens sue the Trump companies, the government, Fair Labor Standards Act, through the Fair Labor Standards Act, filed suit against him as well. The government that he now is supposedly running has also sued him for failing to adhere to laws. The trail of broken contracts runs parallel to another Trump trait, his lack of generosity. Kindness and liberality are part of Cicero's justice checklist, but they are not a part of Trump's character. His phil phil <laughs> philanthropic history is full of empty words and questionable practices. The president's surrogates claim he has given away tens of millions to charity over his career, yet investigations by journalists have found the cash donations to be far less than he boasts. Now remember, his company was also his 501c3, which is a non-for-profit company, was just forced in a settlement in court to have to pay back, and I want to say it was between two and ten million um, that they cheated the people that they had were supposed to be paying. They were not paying, and so the court stepped in and said, "You basically fudged the numbers, and you have to pay." Most of Trump's charitable giving was apparently done by the Trump Foundation. Now that's the Trump Foundation. So Google that recent case. It just came out in the last couple of months and the Trump Foundation had, I want to say they were closed and then also forced to repay the money. Rather than fund it himself, the businessman reportedly used outside donors to fill the foundation's coffers, allowing him to write checks with his name on them without diminishing his own wealth. So he's using contributions into the Trump Foundation, and then he writes the checks from the Trump Foundation, which is not his money, but it's his name, even though he didn't give the money. This is not unheard of, so apparently it's something that happens with that part. Other personal foundations are boosted by outside donations. But in December 2018, the foundation was forced to dissolve after a state investigation. Now, this is what I'm talking about. So this was just in the news, but it began in December 2018. That foundation was forced to dissolve after a state investigation in New York. Now, you know, you know New York is coming for him. Accused it of, quote, a shocking pattern of illegality. This is a court telling the Trump Foundation that Donald Trump started and runs to dissolve after a shocking pattern of illegality, including, quote, functioning as little more than a checkbook to serve Trump's business and political interests. That, that was a court's quote. In one instance, he used $10,000 in money from his charity to buy a six-foot oil portrait of himself. So much for the spirit of giving. That's not to say Trump doesn't donate his own money. He's made a big show within the White House of his decision to forego the $400,000 presidential salary, periodically giving away his paychecks in grand fashion to highlight his magnanimity. Magnanimity. Whether it's at the Department of Transportation or at the Surgeon General's office, he brags about it on Twitter and in person. Trump has gone as far as to insist recipients stage photo ops with the check. 
prominently featuring his name signed in a big Sharpie to show their gratitude. I don't recall other presidents calling attention to their generosity like this so regularly. You should see the awkward reaction from agency heads who realize they are expected to humbly exalt the president when he throws pocket change their way. After burning through millions in their budgets in ways they wouldn't have recommended under any other president. As one joke to me, as one joke to me, at least it's a way for him to pay the taxes he probably owes the American people. Now remember, these are his people inside the White House who are just dealing with him saying, we know he probably owes them taxes because, you know, at some point the taxes are going to be released. I mean, he can fight it for only so long. It's up in the Supreme Court now. Eventually we'll get kicked back down. And it's going to happen at some point. The taxes are going to be released. All this nonsense is going to come out and it's going to be what it's going to be. But at least they're saying, well, if he's giving away money, he probably owes it anyways. Together, these examples paint a clear picture. Donald Trump is not a paragon of justice. He's not worried about maintaining good fellowship with people, treating others fairly, keeping his promises, or demonstrating generosity. While he has sought to cultivate the image of an unselfish billionaire, he is not. Many of us who've joined his administration recognize he is a vindictive, self-promoting person who spends inordinate time attacking others to advance his interests. I think that's one of the most um, artfully worded sentences I think I've read so far about him, kind of a, a full picture. If you think of that, vindictive, self-promoting, who spends an inordinate time attacking others to advance his interests. Like that pretty much rounds out who he is. Those qualities translate into governing, and they do. As a result, we have all learned the hard way that the president's modus operandi, MO, emphasizes combat over peacemaking bullying over negotiating, malice over clemency, and recognition over true generosity. In sum, he is the portrait of an unjust man. The next section, the president's courage. Cicero says courage is the, quote, virtue which champions the cause of right. The president believes he's the champion of great righteous causes. He carries the banner of any number of public issues with his fight to win style. A courageous person takes both credit and blame when they are the leader, yet Trump refuses to, refuses to do the latter. When his team loses, Donald Trump is nowhere to be seen. Now, you know, we've seen that all of his people, all his campaign people, from Roger Stone to Manafort to Cohen, his lawyers, his finance campaign guys, are in jail, um, but he's nowhere to be seen. And he'll dog you out too. So if you're one of his people, you gotta know it's coming. And if you think, he doesn't care about his people. Do you really think that he cares about his supporters? He does not. He cares about his numbers. And as soon as his numbers start to shift, you got to go off the, you're gonna just go off the side. Th that's when he shows his true colors, when his team loses. Look at any legislative fight the administration has had has had with Congress. If we were on the side that failed, the president did everything to avoid blame for the fear of being labeled the loser. The atmosphere created by his craven attitude is dispiriting to the team. I remember during the president's first year how often he promised we were going to reform the U.S. healthcare system, a topic of major focus during the campaign. Trump pledged to repeal and replace Obamacare. You know, that's all he talks about, which was replete with problems and distorting the marketplace. It looked like Republicans had the votes in Congress, but when the effort inexplicably, inexplicably collapsed, the president didn't show courage by taking the fall. He pointed fingers at weak senators who voted against repeal and privately blamed staff. Little has happened on the issue since. His I'm not it demeanor has been copied by those beneath him, creating a culture where people scurry away from problems to avoid shouldering the blame. Scott Pruitt was remembered for this during his tenure as the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, where he blamed staff for his misuse of government funds rather than just take responsibility. He was ultimately forced to resign. Bravery comes in different forms. It's not just a willingness to take a popularity hit when something doesn't go the right way. It can be far more serious. In some cases, it means actually putting your life on the line. I don't know how many times Trump has been in such a position. Most people rarely are in their lives. But the one example we have is telling. You know where he's going with this. At the height of the Vietnam War, when others were joining the US military to serve their country, he sought to avoid the draft. You don't have to look much farther than that whole thing in and of itself. Trump received five 
deferments. Four for education, one for medical reason, and you know we understand that. The excuse, bone spurs in his feet. The injury was concocted, according to the daughters of the podiatrist who made the diagnosis, as well as the president's former lawyer who recounted Trump saying, you think I'm stupid? I wasn't going to Vietnam. Don't fool yourself into believing this goes unnoticed by the men and women he commands in the US military or the veterans who didn't have a convenient way out of Vietnam. They would have gone to war with or without an excuse and they deserve better than the boasts of a man who stayed home. I'll just let that sit for a second. If that by itself doesn't determine this man's character for you, bravery is not the only component of courage. So it's unfair to judge the president on that score alone. Cicero suggests that a courageous person also is someone who is not swayed by the masses. He who is carried by the foolishness of the ignorant mob should not be counted a great man. And someone who is not, quote, conquered by pleasure, unquote, and greed. Nothing is more the mark of a mean and petty spirit than to love riches. Fortitude is also important. It is the mark of a truly brave and constant spirit that one remain unperturbed in difficult times, and when agitated, not be thrown, as the saying goes, off one's feet, but rather hold fast to reason with one's spirit and counsel ready to hand. Thus, aside from bravery, the checklist for a courageous person includes resistance to the mob mentality, avoidance of obsession with money and pleasure, and stability through crises. On the first account, it would be difficult to describe the president as someone who is not carried away by public passions. As we will discuss later, he fuels rather than avoids mob behavior, and he is demonstrably obsessed with a public opinion. This is second nature to a man who spent years obsessing over TV ratings, right? And we talked about this in the first chapter. We know he runs this country like it is a TV show, like it is a reality game show to him. And I think in his mind, he just figured, I don't know what I'm doing and I can't do this anyway, but these people seem to like it. So I'm just going to run it like a TV show. Our tweeter in chief survives on a diet of likes and retweets. Now you remember he got all upset with Twitter because he felt he was losing followers and he wasn't getting all the likes that he wanted. Like this is what he's worried about. Analysis of his feed shows that he has mentioned opinion polls almost every single month since becoming president. It's not rare for a meeting about economic growth or national security to include, get this, stray comments about recent poll numbers. While he's, dis while he's supposed to be discussing other stuff, he's talking about his poll numbers. His favorite polls are predictably any that show him ahead. Regardless of how dubious the sourcing, Trump blows his top when outlets report his unpopularity, especially those that he thinks should be in his camp, such as Fox News. When their professional polling operations ad accurately reflects his unpopularity, polls and polling to him are demonstrations of loyalty, not scientific measures of the country's mood. They aren't data points to help him feed into deliberations as with any other politician on earth. They are only meant to feed his vanity. So what he doesn't get is a poll is a scientific data point from a certain uh, cross section of the country at any given point in any, in any given place. And there's polling companies and science and companies that know the science of this, but it is, it's only one measure, right? And so normal people take that in and they give it the proper weight um, depending on whatever issue that they're trying to work through so they can strategize about what are different ways to go after something. You don't just take it as X amount of people like me or they, oh, they like me today or they don't like me today or this is so-and-so's fault or this is such-and-so's fault. It's part of a bigger pie that you use to strategize and normal people understand that. And, <laughs> and if they don't like him, then they must be wrong. We know where such an attitude inevitably leads, failure. Margaret Thatcher, a giant of modern history to whom Trump could never be favorably compared, once warned, if you set out to be liked, you would be prepared to compromise on anything at any time, and you would achieve nothing, unquote. The president's craving for high approval ratings is ironic because he does little to deserve them. As for whether or not he is conquered by money and pleasure, I will again let Donald Trump speak for himself, as you just have to do. Quote, I have made the tough decisions always with an eye toward the bottom line. 
quote. The point is, you can't be too greedy, quote. Part of the beauty of me is that I'm very rich, quote. You have to be wealthy in order to be great. Trump's love of money is second only to his love of luxury writ large. His expensive personal tastes and extravagant lifestyles are well documented. They were on full display for America his first week in the White House. Days into the administration, Trump used one of his first major interviews as president to brag to the New York Times about his new famous home. I've had people come in, they walk in here, and they just want to stare for a long period of time, he said. Trump touting the building's many rooms and priceless artwork, not to mention the impeccable service. He woke up to buffet spreads of fruit, pastries, and treats. The staff stocked all of his favorite snacks. And the phones, he said, were, quote, the most beautiful phones I've ever used in my life. It's a beautiful residence. It's very elegant. He gushed to the paper. He reserved his most un- intentionally revealing remarks for when the Times asked about the Oval Office, which he'd already redecorated with new drapes and a rug. Trump told a story about a recent visitor. Quote, the person came into the Oval Office and started to cry. This is a tough person, by the way, but there's something very special about this space, he told the paper. They see the power of the White House and the Oval Office, and they think, yes, Mr. President. Who tells you no? Lastly, Cicero defines courage as the mark of someone who is unperturbed in difficult times, a quality that I cannot assign to President Trump. When faced with tough challenges, he becomes unglued and bombastic. Mr. Bombastic, I'm sorry. The fallout isn't always contained within the White House. It explodes weekly into public view. Aides have stopped counting the number of press conferences, interviews, and events that have gone completely sideways because the president is so unmoored by a problem, whether it is a personal spat or negotiation with Congress. When he is angry about an issue, Trump will let the frustration in his mind boil over, no matter where he's at or what he's doing. It might be the most straightforward event, Person A will speak, and aide will brief him. Person B will introduce you, Mr. President, and then you will deliver the following written remarks. She hands him a short speech. Trump will glance at the page, cross the words out with a big black sharpie, then take the remarks in a different direction. If the press is in the room, the direction he tends to go is off the deep end of the swimming pool. He'll change the order of events on the spot and launch into a tirade. That's how an event about tax reform can turn into an endless rant about millions and millions of illegal voters ruining the democratic process. When faced with foreign policy dilemmas, his tendency is to put up to puff up his puff up his chest and feign toughness, not to keep his cool. For instance, rather than dismiss incendiary adversaries, Trump tries to outdo them. Quote, North Korean leader Kim Jong Un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I too have a nuclear button, but it is much bigger and more powerful than his, and my button works. In response to Iranian saber-rattling, the president tweeted, if Iran wants to fight, then that will be the official end of Iran. Never threaten the United States again. These outbursts might be cathartic in the moment, but they tend to aggravate the situation. First of all, we are not, he's not five years old. This isn't like your little kid that is like throwing a fit at the dinner table. Like this is foreign policy. These are leaders. These are allies. These are people we're working with. These are other nations, state actors. And he's literally just throwing out whatever comes into his head. Egging on unstable dictators risks a misunderstanding that can spiral into a crisis. At a minimum, the above examples led to prolonged public feuds that distracted from the issue at hand or delayed our ability to respond effectively to international events. Aristotle once wrote that he who exceeds in confidence when it comes to frightening things is reckless, and the reckless person is held to be both a boaster and a pretender to courage. Trump is not brave nor unswayed by the crowd, nor uncommanded by money and pleasure, nor unstable through crises. He is a pretender to courage, and that should give everyone pause. <sighs> the president's temperance. Finally, we must judge Trump's temperance, which is easier to do than the other virtues, for it is the most obvious. 
Cicero explains the characteristic as something showing restraint and modesty and being seemly. Said another way, conducting oneself in an inoffensive manner. Cicero adds that such a person is also not careless. One must ensure, therefore, that the impulses obey reason, that we do nothing rashly or at random without consideration or care. He concludes that men of temperance handle criticism well and are not readily provoked. So the, th this is something that as parents, as humans, if you work, if you're a professional, the Bible teaches this the notion of the gifts of the spirit, of temperance, of long suffering, of being a professional, uh, being a person that is stable, steady, constant, right? Not emotional. So what's interesting is <laughs> we expect that in all other areas of our life and somehow now within the presidency and the most highest and highly revered office in the land, we have decided that that is not something that that is necessarily um, a prerequisite. It should be evident by now that Trump is one of the more difficult, one of one of the more offensive public figures in recent times. The president has difficulty showing restraint and lashes out without warning. His behavior is quintessentially unseemly, from crude rhetoric, vulgar jokes to immodest public reactions. There are far too many examples, so we will choose one category. Nowhere is this more apparent than in his attitude toward women. Many in the Trump administration are put off by his misogynist, misogynistic behavior, which began well before the election. So this is the part that I I just cannot fathom. I mean, you could pick, pick a topic, but especially for women. And any man who has women in your life, right, how can you, how can you get behind a person that has said and treated women in the most public way, so it's not a secret about what he feels and how and how he treats women, and yet will stand behind or put in words of support or votes for this individual is beyond me. And that's just regarding women. How does Trump talk about women? Here we go. Sex appeal, beautiful piece of a ass, good shape, bimbo, great in bed, a little chubby, not hot, crazed, psycho, lonely, fat, fat. A, stupid, nasty woman, dog, ugly face, dog face, horse face, disgusting. These are the types of comments he makes. Now, this isn't Trump with his boys in the locker room by himself as a common citizen. So you may say, oh, I say those things. Well, okay. But you're not the president of the United States, and this is not your administration commenting on your words and thoughts about women. Trump did not spare his opponent, the first female presidential nominee of a major US political party of his sexism either. And let's just stop there for a second. Whatever you think about Hillary, you have to respect that she was the first woman to stand in that place, to hold those shoes, and just out of respect as a human, but out of respect as a woman, any male, any man in that position would understand that that notion of respect is something that you want to model and want others to model after. Regardless of, okay, well, I'm, I'm in competition with this person, there's a level of mutual respect that was never given. Trump did not spare his opponents of his sexism either. If Hillary Clinton can't satisfy her husband, he tweeted in 2015, what makes her think she can satisfy America? At a campaign stop in Ohio the next year, he remarked, does she look presidential? Does she look presidential, fellas? Give me a break. I don't care if you supported Hillary Clinton or not. There is no denying the smoldering sexism heaped onto those words. And what's funny now is this guy is still sitting within supporting anonymous this behavior. All of these men are. These were public tweets. And anyone that has a mother, sister, daughter, aunt, you literally supporting this man to me is disgusting. Forget politics, Democrat, Republican. You are supporting a man who spoke of and to a woman and women in such a fashion. That speaks more about you than it does about the president. Everybody knows his problem. I said, but those that stand and still continue to stand, shocking to me. At times, his sentiments border on what many women today would call predatory. Yeah. Trump once purportedly made the following statement referring to himself in the third person, quote, love him or hate him, Donald Trump is a man who is certain about what he wants and sets out to get it, no holds barred. Women find his power almost as much of a turn on as his money, unquote. 
Here again, I can't resist citing Margaret Thatcher, who dealt with men like this. Quote, power is like being a lady, she remarked. If you have to tell people you are, you aren't. In 2013, Trump opined on the tens of thousands of unreported sexual assaults in the military, tweeting, what did these geniuses expect when they put men and women together? And of course, he famously described to NBC's Billy Rush his efforts to win over a married woman and how he approached seduction in general. Quote, I don't even wait, he said. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the P, you know this quote, you can do anything. As president, the inappropriate comments about women haven't abated. I've sat and listened in uncomfortable silence as he talks about a woman's appearance or performance. He comments on makeup. He makes jokes about weight. He critiques clothing. He questions the toughness of women in and about his orbit. He uses words like sweetie and honey to address accomplished professionals. This is precisely the way a boss shouldn't act in the work environment. And let me just tell you something. If a, if a, if a woman employee had a boss that treated her in such a fashion she could file for sexual harassment, potentially sexual assault, depending on what was going on, if, if he touched her in any form or fashion, but definitely sexual assault, hostile work environment. These are things that laws are written to protect against. And the person that's literally sitting in the highest office is not only doing these things, but people are watching him and not saying anything. Trump's commentary on specific women in his administration sometimes will happen right in front of them. And this is how you know they are all just on the team and have totally lost sight of humanity, their own and others, because they literally know what he's doing. They don't question it. They don't have to read it in an article. They don't have to wonder. They are witnessing it firsthand and, have, and are continuing to allow it to go on and even for him to run again while they know this behavior is going on. And this isn't bipartisan. Sexual harassment. Hostile work environments should not be bar bipartisan. Trump's commentary on specific women in his administration sometimes will happen right in front of them. After one such instance, an official came to me exasperated to commiserate. Quote, he is a total misogynist, she complained. This is not a healthy workplace. Why do you think that this woman feels that she can't say or do anything? I just want us to stop and think about that for a second. We have women and men right now in the White House is what this book is saying that have witnessed and are witnessing and experiencing this behavior from the president of the United States. And no one's saying and doing anything. I'm not trying to say women who work for Trump are victims who can't handle themselves. Women have had to deal with creeps long before Donald Trump came into office. Just because that's a fact or because it's a precedence or because it's history doesn't mean it's something that should be continued to carry on as if, well, people get hurt, people get cut, people get this and that, so this and that, we don't have to watch our behavior. That is all the more reason why the line should be drawn and the standard continue to be raised. And for these men to be sitting around allowing this to happen in 2019, sickening. Women have to deal with creeps long before Donald Trump came into office. They don't need, quote unquote, safe spaces set up in the West Wing. I, I would argue maybe they do. Still, his displays of misogyny are unusual and unsettling to women who at times feel they are given different treatment than their male counterparts. When it's about female leaders outside the administration, TV hosts or public figures, word gets around that the president's offensive remarks and asides, and we bemoan in private another deep character flaw over which we have no control. And I would argue they do have control because they need to throw the flag. He's throwing the flag, but in a way that you can't really, what, what are they gonna do? If, if they had, full on need to say full stop to the Republican party, this guy's gotta go, we gotta get someone in here that has standards and character and respects people. Not even his family is off limits. Although sharing his last name usually preserves them from the worst, though not the weirdest comments. And we've all heard the comments he said about his own daughter. Shifting public attitudes appear to have little effect on his views towards sexual harassment. What does that mean? Is that the public, the people pretend they don't like it, but they, they support him. And that's even, that's, Indeed, Donald Trump is like the Fred Flintstone of the Me Too era. He's been accused of sexual misconduct by roughly two dozen women, and his strategy is to shred their testaments to his inappropriate behavior. In an exchange between the president and a friend about inappropriate conduct, journalist Bob Woodward recounts Trump saying, quote, you've got to deny, 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 and push back on these women. If you admit to anything and any culpability, then you're dead. 
You've got to be strong. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to push back hard. You've got to deny anything that's said about you. Never admit. Understood, Mr. President. This quote didn't escape notice by the women on your staff. Cicero says temperance demands forethought and doing nothing, quote unquote, at random. Yet the president is notorious for his rash decision making as discussed throughout this book. Trump boasts of making tough calls based on his gut instincts in the moment rather than good information and a clear strategy. Then there are the distractions. It's no exaggeration to say we have a commander in chief who is channel surfing his way through the presidency. Meetings are constantly interrupted by TV. Conversations are sidetracked by commentary about TV. Early morning phone calls are made from the residents about what he saw on TV. He displays fury at what is not on TV, including lieutenants who avoid going on cable networks to defend him. Trump takes notice when they skip the Sunday shows or pre-scheduled appearances to avoid having to answer questions about his latest antics, and he holds it against them. The president, as has been amply documented, is obsessed with television and segments he doesn't like can derail entire work days across the administration. It's his gluttonous, vanity-pleasing digestion of TV coverage about himself that leads to the most embarrassing outbursts. I recall one bright Tuesday morning when the president was still in the residence, a Twitter alert popped on my phone. Trump was venting about something he's, he'd evidently seen on cable news. In that moment, he could have chosen to talk about the meeting he'd had the day before with the Brazilian president or the funerals that were taking place in New Zealand after a mass shooting by a white supremacist or the fact that it was his son's birthday. Instead, the president was going off on George Conway, the husband of his senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway whose critiques of the president were making minor news. George Conway, often referred to as Mr. Kellyanne Conway by those who know him, is very jealous of his wife's success and angry that I, with her help, didn't give him the job he so desperately wanted. I barely know him, but just take a look, a stone cold loser and husband from hell. That was a tweet from the president. Rather than focus on issues that mattered that day, he let Mr. Conway's criticism distract him completely. He, redir he redirected the news cycle toward total nonsense, not to mention the fact that he openly derided the spouse of one of his employees, another workplace red flag. These flare-ups are constant. They come at the worst times. For instance, on the anniversary of September 11th attacks, the president couldn't bring himself to hold off on politics for the morning to honor the victims and their families. He lashed out at Democrats and media outlets in a Quote, in a hypothetical poll done by one of the worst pollsters of them all, the Amazon Washington Post ABC, which predicted I would lose to Crooked Hillary by 15 points. How did that work out? <coughs> Sleepy Joe, Pocahontas, and virtually all others would beat me in the general election. He tweeted at daybreak. Quote, this is a phony suppression poll meant to build up their Democratic partners. Quote, damn it. Quote, I thought, can't we just focus for a few hours? This is the writer. Other times, the White House might be in the midst of responding to a national crisis, but a fly on the wall will find the president is far more interested in responding to the haters online than doing his job. Calm leaders are able to let criticism wash over them. President Lincoln claimed to avoid reading personal attacks altogether. When he did encounter a particularly strong critique of, the pres of his presidency, he would sit at his desk and compose a fiery refutation. After that, he would get up and walk away without sending it. That is not the Trump style. The president takes all criticism personally. He cannot imagine letting it go unanswered. And unlike Lincoln, he does not see temperance as a virtue. He hits send. I still remember the gnawing ache in the pit of my stomach, the quiet tension, the sunken faces at work. We were zombies roaming the administration. No words had to be exchanged. The day we all knew was coming had arrived. The day that any remaining questions about President Donald J. Trump's character was definitely answered. For some, it was a turning point. There are many episodes that capture Donald Trump's character, but this one stands out in my memory. On August 12, 2017, organizers of what was called a Unite the Right rally gathered to protest the removal of a Robert E. Lee statue from a park in Charlottesville, Virginia. That was their excuse for getting together, at least. They welcomed well-known white supremacist groups, including the neo-Nazis and neo-Confederacy organizations, as well as the Ku Klux Klan. The local media covered the lead up to the rally extensively. On the previous evening, white supremacists conducted an unauthorized march through the University of Virginia campus, where they chanted, quote, Jews will not replace us, end quote. 
White Lives Matter, and Blood and Soil. They were met by university students who had stood together around a statue of Thomas Jefferson to oppose the group. The encounter turned violent, only exacerbating the unease exasperating the unease in the city before the larger event was scheduled to take place the next day. A counter protest to the Unite the Right rally was organized, representing a wide swath of religious, ethnic, and other interest groups, as well as local concerned citizens. Violent clashes again followed. In the afternoon, the scene turned deadly. A self-identified white supremacist from Ohio deliberately rammed his vehicle into a crowd of counter protesters, sending bodies flying into the air. More than 30 people were reported injured and one woman, Heather Heyer, was killed. The city declared a state of emergency. The crisis in Charlottesville became an international news story. It is impossible to know exactly what information Donald Trump absorbed about this event, the first real test of his ability as president to respond to civil unrest in our country. He weighed in from his golf course in New Jersey, stating that there, quote, was no place for this kind of violence in America. That was not all. He condemned the hate and the, quote, unquote, violence on many sides. On many sides. He repeated it again. What on earth did he mean by that, I thought, when he uttered those words? Trump seemed to suggest the counter-protesters were also to blame. He failed to specifically denounce the extremist, group, extremist groups. In fairness, I considered it was possible the president, like others, didn't want to get ahead of the facts about the incident since we didn't know who all the victims were. I knew deep down, though, that the truth wasn't good. He didn't want to admit it because the violent group was a pro-MAGA crowd. Now, again, we've all heard this whole thing, but this is one of his boys saying, oh, yeah, he said it. And, oh, yeah, he didn't want to jump on it because it was, one, it was a pro-MAGA crowd. The bipartisan outcry was immediate. One of the president's staunchest defenders on Capitol Hill, Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah, a defender, joined a number of his colleagues in urging the president to clarify his remarks and condemn the hate groups by name. Meanwhile, white supremacists hailed Trump's statements in their own publications because they saw it as a defense of their cause. Again, collateral effects. On Monday, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, remember Jeff Sessions? Oh, he's gone. Labeled the incident an evil act of domestic terrorism. White House staff frantically worked to get the president to approve a new statement to make clear he too was opposed to white supremacists and neo-Nazis. In the meantime, top CEOs began resigning from administration advisory councils in protest of the president's amb ambivalence, including the heads of Under Armour, Intel, and Merck. Although he would later inform reporters that his first statement in Charlotte's Charlottesville violent aftermath was beautiful. The president yield yielded and gave a new public statement singling out the hate groups. Do you see everything that they had to do just to get him to say something that would be a common sense thing? On Tuesday, it took a turn for the worse. During a press conference at a New York Trump Towers meant to be about U.S. infrastructure, the president went off on a rant about Charlottesville and seemed to cast aside the revised statements issued the day before. So remember, he said it, then they revised it. Now he's going again off the deep end. He condemned the vehicular homicide, but then he opined that the Unite the Right rally included some very fine people, here we go, and that the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. The dazed, resigned look on the chief of staff, John Kelly's face, remember John Kelly, he's gone to, went viral and for good reason. Those of us watching it live had to pick our jaws up off the floor. What was he talking about? It was hard for anyone to imagine very fine people innocently stumbling across a neo-Nazi rally that was widely publicized in advance. Very fine people seemed highly unlikely to join marchers who carried signs with swastikas and bellowed anti-Semitic slogans. David Duke and Richard Spencer, well-known white supremacists, were not very fine people. Trump did not stop there. He defended the alt-right demonstration, comparing the removal of the Confederate leader statue to bringing down those of the founding fathers, y'all. Quote, this week, it is Robert E. Lee. I wonder, is it George Washington next? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you have to ask yourself, where does it stop? He again blamed both sides for the violence, including the counter-protesters that he labeled the alt-left. Do they have any semblance of guilt, he asked? This was the real Trump speaking, not the scripted one. 
Donald Trump has been accused of being a bigot, whether it is of conviction or convenience is debated. I personally has never, have never believed the president is racist in his heart of hearts, but what difference does it make if the effect is the same? So when people say, oh, he's not racist, but if you have all racist tendencies and the ripple effects are racist, does it really matter whether or not you intentionally are racist or you just having racist effects on everyone around you? Or if it's in your heart, what does it really matter? When he makes statements that encourage racists and knows full well he's doing it, it is wrong. This is hard, his people. More damning than that is his aloofness. The American public can see that the administration is not doing enough to counter racially motivated violence. Why is that? Because ultimately the man at the top doesn't show interest. <clears throat> in the minds of Trump boosters, problems such as white supremacy are an invention of the left to push an identity politics agenda. As a result, the president is reluctant to act, hesitant to lead the charge on an issue that might alienate some of his supporters, his bottom line, all the while ignoring a deadly brush fire sweeping the hearts and minds of a small but menacing faction here at home. The sense of disappointment throughout the administration was palpable after Charlottesville. We felt the president's reaction revealed an uglier side of his nature. I don't know what it's gonna take for these people. The shallow and demagogic polit politician prone to self-inflicted disaster. So many of us were already frustrated by the president's handling of his job. Now, purposely or not, he was channeling the views of bigots who were in turn excited that an American leader was sticking up for them. Once And, and again, remember, Trump doesn't care who likes him as long as someone likes him. Once people like David Duke are praising you, and David Duke retweeted that, a normal person quickly figures out they're on the wrong track and corrects course, not Donald Trump. Of all the crazy, embarrassing statements we were enduring weekly, his comments about Charlottesville took the cake. It was repugnant. I thought of how the Republican Party, which once helped propel the civil rights movement, now has as its mouthpiece a man whose words fed racial intolerance. I wondered, would he learn anything from this? Could he learn anything from this? And how the hell do I stick around? Those are really good questions as I read this. Like, this person knows this, sees this, clearly has a conscience, clearly knows right from wrong, and has not thrown the full stop flag to all of his, to the Republican Party. Like, they're allowing him to keep moving forward. I know that's a question many of you are asking. Why didn't anyone leave? God knows it would have been easy. We all have draft resignation letters in our desks or on our laptop. That's the half teasing, half true advice you get on day one in the Trump administration or immediately following Senate confirmation. Be sure to write your resignation letter. You may need it at a moment's notice or less. Some of us did consider resigning on the spot. One journalist reported a cabinet member saying he would have written a resignation letter, taken it to the president, and shoved it up his boop. The sentiment was shared, but in the end, no one angrily stormed out. There was no protest resignation because they just weren't pissed enough or it didn't affect them. Why do people stay? A close friend asked me at the time. You all should quit. He's a mess. That's why I responded, because he's a mess. It was true for a lot of us. We thought we could keep it together. The answer feels more hollow than it used to. Maybe my friend was right. Maybe that was a lost moment where a rush to the exits would have meant something. The mood in the administration darkened in the months ahead. The controversy left a permanent bruise on Trump's presidency. We were only partway through our first year, yet I feared and knew it was a harbinger of more to come. It was also the moment when I received the answer to that lingering question I had about him. Because remember, they all came in thinking that they could do something the question was whether or not Trump, oh, the question was not whether Trump was a model leader. Such a conclusion would have been laughable by that point. The question was whether the presidency would at least instill in this man the ability to be a bigger person than he was, whether he could rise to meet the moment. That was my hope. Not long after, as I was walking the state floor of the White House, I scanned the portraits of American leaders adorning the quarters. Once one thought started to grip me and never left. Donald Trump does not belong among them. He isn't a man of great character or good character. He is a man of none. And that brings us to chapter three. 
want to thank everybody for tuning in and listening, y'all. Um, all of the videos are available on our YouTube channel. I'll probably drop a link in the comments if you want to catch up. We did the intro, two parts of chapter one, and these are the two parts of chapter two. And we'll be starting chapter three probably in the next couple of days. I hope everyone's enjoying the holiday season. I just want to send my love out to everybody. I just want to encourage you during this season where so much is happening politically, um, to find ways to seek and search for hope. And I think education, I think um, information brings hope. Uh, once we can see through the darkness and some education and hope and education and information brings light and light allows us to see through the darkness. So I just wanna encourage y'all like, don't, don't be discouraged. As irritating as all of this is, it's confirmation. Um, and sowing and reaping is real. Um, kind of cause and effect is real and what people put out there, they will receive back to them. And so no person can exist in this state for any sort of sustained period of time without the entire thing falling down. And so it is kind of just what it is. And so I just, um, I just encourage everybody to keep seeking knowledge, keep seeking wisdom, keep, keep seeking direction mm -hmm. um, by God into whatever you got going on in your life and what we have for this country, because it's all of us coming together. That's really gonna make a difference. But anyway, I just, uh, that's all I got. Sending love and peace to everybody. And we out. Peace.